Hello, welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Matthew Lucas. And I'm Stephen Ryan. You are indeed. And we post every week, so why don't you press the subscribe button and the alert button to keep up with our adventures. Do indeed. And this week our adventure is based upon Stephen Ryan's sensitivity. So, way, 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 way back in summer we were filming in another part of Stephen's garden and I saw this plant that was quite unusual. I said, Stephen, what is this plant? And... I planted it for the critters. For the butterflies. Yes. So this episode is going to be about the plants that Stephen has planted in his garden solely, although you do put an asterisk around that, for the use of animals, Stephen. Yes. Well, we have to be part of the environment. And who knew that beneath this exterior there was a sensitive, <laughs> beating soul who cares about caterpillars? Yes, exactly. <laughs> So without further ado, Stephen, I think we should go and look at this mythic caterpillar plant that you planted for the caterpillars. Why not indeed? So we shot this bit of video in summer when the plant was at its full glory, so let's go back in time. Asclepius syriacus is a plant that you plant specifically for the monarch or wanderer butterfly, yeah. which is North American in yes. origin, but it has found its way to Australia by us planting these plants. So firstly, wanderer by name, wanderer by nature. That's exactly. a long way to come. It's had to do a bit of island hopping. So the it, Pacific, I Yes, presume. I assume so. Yeah. So it's come across the islands as the milkweeds, which these are commonly known as, because yeah. if you pull a leaf off, it will exude a white milky oh. sap. It has the furriest underside to the leaves. Yeah, and it's, it, look, it's not an overly showy plant. The foliage is pleasant. True. And so is it these rather unprepossessing flowers that the, the wanderer, having wandered a long way, is attracted to? No, it's not. It's actually the foliage, and it lays its eggs on the foliage, the plant itself is actually toxic oh. uh, and so what then happens is when the caterpillars come out yeah. they're toxic as well so that stops them being predated as Britney Spears may have said yes so it's toxic um, but isn't Asclepius after whom it's named the god of healing and medicine he certainly was Are if you, you believe by my life. I am very impressed so if you believe your Greek mythology um, Which we do, yeah, of course we do then yes he was the the god of medicine and healing yeah and although this plant is toxic lots of toxic plants have medical uses in tiny quantities so I'm not quite sure what they would have used Asclepius for yeah. but it may well have some medical usage toxicity is it i mean if you if we touch it I mean, where does the toxicity you'd have to eat it in yeah you'd, you'd have to eat it i don't know about how big a quantity you need to eat but you'd have to eat it and the sap is very sticky and uh it's a white sort of uh, resinous sap i guess if you've got enough of that in your mouth if you've been pruning them down or doing something to them you might be ill but you know just how deadly the plant is, is a moot point. Rule of thumb, just don't eat it. Yeah, well, exactly. If it doesn't come in a punter, do you bought it from the greengrocer, I probably wouldn't eat it. Steer clear. <laughs> um, now, the other thing is then, you're planting this essentially for the caterpillars to feed off. My thinking would be then that the plant is not going to look its best. No. In <laughs> until late summer. Yes, well, if the caterpillars do come in this year, yes, they will start eating the plant, and so therefore it won't be looking at its uh, aesthetic best. But that's not really what it's all about. I mean, the, the final product is the beautiful butterfly, which is seriously aesthetically beautiful. I planted it with the idea of actually attracting wanderer butterflies. Now, it's been in the garden here for three, maybe four years. Yeah. And last summer was the first summer I actually had my first monarch or wanderer butterfly. What a beautiful story, Mr. Yes, uh, I'm so sweet when it comes <laughs> to my insect friends. <laughs> all right, well, let's move on to the next. All right, what a good idea. Oh, there's one. <laughs> I'm sure that was a wanderer. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Stephen Ryan. Well, there you go. A plant specifically for a specific species of butterfly, which I've been attracting into my garden. And have you managed to attract them, Stephen? Are you attractive <laughs> to butterflies? This is the question we all want to know. All right. The first year it went in, yes, the butterflies arrived. And that was the footage that we dropped into the yeah. film. This year, I haven't seen any. What but, about the one that we saw? Oh, yeah, but it didn't land. It didn't stay. So, it didn't have fun and lay eggs. No, it didn't seem to. But we did have a really cool, mild season, and I think it was probably against them this year. Ah, so right. next year, I'll have oodles of them. So was the plant eaten at all? No. No. No, no. Oh. It stayed in pristine fail, condition. Fail, fail, fail. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, well, you know what? Maybe we need to move on to something that you had more success with. What a good idea. <laughs> 
All right, Stephen, in the journey through your garden of things, you've planted specifically for animals, insects, whatever. Mm. Why this? All right. I must say first yes. that nothing is ever planted just for the animals, really. No, because uh, you're not that kind of guy. <laughs> no, no, no. Look, I'm very happy to encourage animals into the garden, but... It also has to perform in other ways as well. I mean, okay. there's no point in planting some weedy little something in the garden that might attract butterflies or something if it doesn't at least look vaguely attractive. So attractiveness first, then animal attracting next. Okay. And this particular plant, Agapede serpens, is mm -hmm. growing in a pot outside our kitchen window. Which we'll show you. Yes, and it is specifically here. Yeah. One, because it looks attractive. It does. But when it's in flower, it's little red tubular flowers are uh, an absolute magnet for our local honey eaters. Ah. And it just goes to show that it doesn't always have to be a native plant to attract native animals, which is something that people need to be aware of. I've even heard some claptrap about, you know, you have to plant native uh, plants for animals because the nectar of exotic plants is potentially not good for them. And I'm sorry, but nectar is sugar. <laughs> and it's going Whether to be much it's the same. Brazilian, yeah. Australian, British. Yeah, and who knows, the birds might want to go out for Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> why not indeed? Let's go and have a curry. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so the birds. This so this is a native of the Himalayas. The Himalayas. Yeah, so it comes from Thailand, Myanmar, uh, northern India. So quite how to choose. And we yeah. actually did include this in a story about tropical blueberries. So exactly. if you want to know more about the care for this, watch that other video, which we'll link below. Yep. But you have mentioned before about the tubular nature of flowers yes. and the pollinators. Tell our viewers a little bit more about the colour and the bird. Yeah. All right. Well, birds see red really well. So there you go. There you so go. Who knew? I didn't. Now red flowers are a, a magnet to them. Uh, those who live in North America and Central America where there are, and in fact, South America, where there are hummingbirds, they will know about the tubulous sort of flower that will attract those birds. Yep. And in Australia, we have our own honey eaters and spine bills and things, which are basically our version. But they don't hover. They 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 settle. They, yeah, and they tend go. to perch and then go in for the nectar. But I have seen, and I don't know if this is an adaptation, but I have now seen small Australian honey eaters actually hovering in front of yep. blooms. To they're get not the quite nectar. as good as the hummingbird. No, not it. as fast. No, no, but they can sort of hover in the air and and try and go in for the nectar. So if you've got plants in that group, then you know that you're going to be um, attracting birds into the garden and. I planted these ones specifically outside our kitchen window so that if I'm being the drudge and I'm washing the dishes and doing the As things... As you and, should. Yes, and making the meal or whatever, because the kitchen sink is somewhere where most of us spend an awful lot of time. Looking. And so therefore, it's nice to have something to take your attention whilst you're dropping the dishes on the floor. And this does it in the spring. So it's fantastic. Isn't that a great idea to put something in your line of sight in the kitchen that is not only beautiful, but is also going to be attracting wildlife? Yeah. Good on you. Um, just a question, though, about tubular flowers. Is it right to say that all red tubular flowers are going to be attractive to birds? Honey Pretty well. Birds? pretty well anything with that sort of shape no matter where it's from yeah because i have aloes for example that flower with orange tubular flowers yeah. and australian honey eaters and that's not a native to our country yeah. australian honey eaters love them yeah exactly so anything with that sort of tubular flower they are almost hardwired to go and investigate Whoosh, so they will in fact go and have a look at those flowers see whether there's a decent nectar source once they're found it they'll keep coming back again and, and they'll again. tell their children their yeah, family they, and their friends they definitely will okay well this this is wonderful. This is your kitchen outlook. Let's go and look at something else. All right, what a good idea. Agapiti, Stephen. Yes, another plant that I put in for the animals, and this time it's, of course, for the birds. And it succeeds. Did you get flowers this spring, though? Not a lot. It was, again, a poor season for the agapetes to mm. flower well, although I think I'm in for a corker one. This year there's buds already forming, so come the following spring, Aha. they should have oodles to oh, feed from. I must look at mine. I haven't looked at it recently. All right, what could our third plant be? Well, this one's a big one, so let's go and have a look at it. All right, Stephen, animal planting continued. What are we considering behind us now? All right, this is probably rather esoteric for our North American and, uh, and European viewers, perhaps. 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 As but, Doris Day may have said, yeah, perhaps. Perhaps. But behind us is a Eucalyptus viminalis, uh, the manna gum. And it was planted for the animals. 
Which animal in particular? Well, particularly the koala, which of course in North America and funnily enough in Europe is not known to roam wild. So, and, visit, and visit gardens in deepest Surrey or yeah, Vir exactly. Virginia. Exactly. So we had an issue where a lot of trees were disappearing out of our street, mm. uh, particularly large eucalypts. And so we decided we would plant some because we do get the occasional visit from a koala through our area here. And they are just such an iconic creature. Mm. Of course we want them in our garden. And good to point out to non-Australian viewers is that the koala only eats certain types of eucalypts. So yeah. you can't just plant anything. You have they're, to plant yeah, one of, I don't know how many species. There's, I think, around about 10 or a dozen species of eucalypts that the koala will eat mm. as a rule. Mm. It may extend its diet if it finds one it hasn't tried before, but generally speaking, you've got to select the right one. The managum, Eucalyptus viminalis, is local to this area, so mm. it is a local tree. Mm. We didn't actually have any of them, though, on our block when mm. we first bought this as a vacant block before building the house. Yeah. And because of the loss of trees and habitat, we just felt it was a good idea. I mean, lots of other creatures use them. I mean, the parrots will eat the flowers and get the nectar from the flowers. Uh, there's a whole gamut of insects and other creatures that live on the, um, the eucalypt. So there's you know, lots of other reasons for planting it. But our biggest reason was hopefully to attract some koalas. Have you? No. <laughs> so far, no. And partially due to the fact that when we first started gardening here, the forest actually extended out on either side of us mm. quite a way. Mm. So the koalas sort of had a more of a corridor. Yeah. Unfortunately, most of the eucalypts in the properties on one side of us have disappeared mm. and there's also fewer on the other side. And so there's not quite the corridor through. Uh, we do know that they're out in the forest quite close to us. Yeah. So if there were enough eucalypts out there, yes, they would come in. And we live in hope that one day they will find one of our eucalyptus viminalis and move in for a while. But we do have a picture of a furry friend that you did spot in the yeah, garden which yeah. will will drop in above so uh you planted all of these how big were they when you planted them they were tube stocks so they were little tiny ones that um, were in tree tubes that i got believable. from a local nursery i just said i wanted some viminalis that were hopefully locally provenanced uh, so that i'm putting back into the forest in one way yeah. and i planted two i donated a whole herd of them to different people down the street some of which have survived some of which haven't mm with the intention of trying to create that corridor for the koalas. Wonderful. And these, so how old are these now? Uh, they would be no more than 15 years old. See, that is incredible because they look to me like they'd be nearly a century old. They look very established and beautiful. Mm. They do grow fast. <laughs> so from a gardening perspective, we actually did make a video about what to plant under eucalypts, which we'll attach below. But when you were thinking about so this was um, a bare landscape, basically. Was that part of your scheme about creating sort of high canopy shade as well? Were you oh, thinking yes, that way? Yes. Was it more about sort of the reforestation or the native well, aspect? Well, the eucalypts themselves were more about the reforestation. I mm. mean, it is not that easy to garden under eucalypt trees as a rule. No. So in a lot of other ways, I would have selected something else. But obviously it's the only tree I can plant if I do want to encourage koalas back into their habitat. Mm. So I decided that it was worth it. And mm. I have to say they create other problems as well, apart from growing oh, yeah. things out of them. Yeah. Eucalypts, although they're evergreen, are extremely messy trees, particularly mm. things like Viminalis, which peels its bark and sheds it. And so I normally get enough kindling for the year from the bark and twigs and, and branches and things that shed out of my two eucalyptus viminalises mm. to last me all winter. Mm. So they are messy. So, mm. And they don't drop it all at once like a deciduous tree would do. They drop stuff over quite a prolonged period. And every time there's a storm, more stuff comes down. So they're not the easiest trees to work under. Mm. But look, at the end of the day, uh, I'm happy to do what I've done because I bought a bushish block even though it creates more work for me because I am putting something back into the habitat for the wildlife. Mm. And I mean, the concept of the eucalypt will be familiar with particularly our North American viewers because eucalypts are grown a lot in particularly California. Yes, they certainly are. And even uh, Southern Europe. Yes, yeah, you go through Southern Europe all the way through to Israel. Uh, you go into North Africa. North Africa, yep. yeah. Masses of eucalypts planted there. Madagascar is another place where there's masses of eucalypts where growing. In fact, I mean, they've become pretty weedy and invasive in a lot yeah. of parts of the world, haven't they? They have. So, yeah, so they're, they're not always the right choice if they're out of their native habitat. But, Attracting you know, koalas yeah. in Southern California is perhaps not the way to go. 
And I've also uh, just read a book about winter gardens and some of the alpine eucalypts from Tasmania and the alpine district of Victoria yeah. mm -hmm. are used in European gardens for their bark because they're quite hardy. They are quite hardy and they will grow in those climates quite mm. well. There's only a handful of eucalypts that could be considered as more or less fully hardy in, in England and northern parts of North America. Yeah. But uh, they are picturesque and beautiful trees, mm. well worthwhile growing if you can. But just keep in mind they have an avaristic root system, so you still have to manage growing other things around them. Well, good on you and your attempt to lure back our native koalas. I'm doing my best. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Failures. Steve, well, you're good on you for trying that. Yeah, you know, yeah. Planting a tree is a commitment. It is a commitment, and uh, certainly with the large eucalypt, it's more than a normal commitment, I have to say. And, and uh, we're standing under the shade of both of They are beautiful trees. Oh. I mean, whether the koalas think so or not, it's yeah. their they, loss. They will eventually come and eat off my beautiful, luscious, you know, nutrient-rich eucalypts. You just wait and see if they don't. And although in the, in the film you do mention the fact that that they are difficult to garden under. I'm just saying that I'm not seeing evidence of that here. Mm. The area where the trees are does look stunning. Actually, we'll do a quick shot just to show you. Yes, well, you know, it's all about being a good gardener, really. <laughs> well, <laughs> Sorry. That's why we're here, Stephen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right, let us move on now to our last plant. Yes, and this one is again more for the birds than anything else. Okay, let's have a look. And so rounding out the, what Stephen Ryan has planted for the birds and the bees, well, literally, yes. is, and I'm going to call this Mahonia because I've been listening to you, <laughs> but do we just have to go into the whole name change thing first? Oh yeah, let's just get that out of the way. Yeah, um, all right, so all. Mahonias have now been sunk into the genus Berberus. So this used to be Mahonia media variety Buckland. It is now Berberus media variety Buckland. Now, there was a Mr. and it, they generally, unfortunately, were Mr. Mr. Man. Man. Yes. So he's, now, he's now erased from history. Well, he, he can be a synonym in history, oh, yeah. <laughs> sadly. It's a cruel, cruel... It is cruel. ...summer, as Banana Rama said. But... But, back to this. Yes. Now, there's a few things to keep in mind with this sort of plant uh, as a bird attractant. Yeah. So, firstly... That's what it does primarily. Yes, primarily it's for the birds in the garden. Yep. Uh, the small honey eaters love it when it's in flower. Do they? Yep, so the... Hang on, the flowers are so tiny. Yeah, but they've got a lot of them close together and so they can go along like that okay, and get well, a meal. That is a surprise. Yeah, okay. so there you go. So the honey eaters and spinebills love it. And the main reason that it's particularly useful is, of course, that it flowers in the autumn, early winter, when there's not a lot of other stuff in bloom. So this is the interesting thing. You've got a few counter-seasonal plants in your yeah. repertoire that do yep. things when other things don't. Yeah, exactly. So this is big, and look, it's, it's, are we calling this late autumn now? It is very late autumn. We're almost into winter. Uh, it's in full bloom. It will flower now for at least another month and a half. So I'll get probably three months out of it all up. Uh, and the honey eating birds will come over it regularly and get a feed, but it doesn't end there. But hang on, press pause for a second. And for our viewers not in Australia, uh, at this time of year, naturally, there aren't many native plants in bloom. No, most of our natives tend to be later winter, spring. And so, of course, this isn't an Australian native. It's a, it's a, uh, a plant basically, well, this spe well, this species or this form was bred from two species that came from Asia. Right. But the Mahonias actually do go right through into North America and down into Mexico. Oh. Uh, and so it has quite a wide um, distribution as a genus as was. As was. <laughs> yeah, so, so this one is a hybrid, but it was produced from two of the Asian species. It does flower at a particularly useful time, but it also fruits at a very useful time. And, and I think we've got some imagery of the fruits. The fruits, A, look beautiful. Yep. And B, the birds, beautiful. Yeah, the birds love them. And in fact, it's sort of a two-edged sword because the berries look pretty, but they're not generally around for very long. So once they ripen, the birds clean them up. Uh, they get a meal out of them in the spring, which is a time you don't see a lot of fruit on plants. So again, you've got something that is sort of counter-seasonal. Mm. But the third thing that's really important about this plant yes. is something that people don't think about when it comes to critters in the garden. Yep. And that is prickliness. 
This plant is viciously spiky in As the leaves. hell, can I yeah. tell you? <laughs> yeah, 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 they bite. And I might add, it's even worse when the leaves hit the ground and go dry. I always send the undergardener in to weed under it because... Oh, I haven't seen the undergardener, <laughs> but I'm very curious to yeah. yeah, so it is quite spiky. Hmm. Now, people say, all right, well, you know, why would you want something prickly? But small birds particularly find prickly shrubs a wonderful place to hide out to get away from those larger carnivorous birds and other creatures that might eat them. So it's habitat for them as well. I never knew that. My goodness. So that would be the same well for hollies and all those. Any prickly plant. It could be, you know, anything with spines on the on the branches, things like hawthorns, roses, other plants that have that sort of twiggy spikiness to them are a really good plant to protect small birds. Because that's interesting, because if the bird's the pollinator, the bird can navigate through, but the larger thing that might damage the plant, like eat it, like, mm. you know, whatever, an elephant or something, uh, is obviously going to be then repelled by the spines. Well, that's why plants produce spines, is to repel herbivores Leafy, mainly. Yeah, herbivores. That's yes, the that's the Such word. <laughs> well, Stephen Ryan, that has been a wonderful sweep through your garden. And it's not something, I mean, the notion of planting for pollinators particularly is very much sort of of, of the moment. Yes, it is. Making sure that you've got environment for insects. But the, these things that you've planted are just slightly left of field. So particularly planting something for caterpillars, because everyone is a, well, I am vehemently anti-caterpillar, I'm afraid to say. Is that, oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> a small bird just flew straight through. <laughs> um, because obviously, you know, caterpillars can do damage. So planting a specific plant that attracts a specific butterfly, therefore caterpillar, is a lovely thing, even though you disparaged it by saying, oh, don't just plant an ugly plant for a caterpillar. You yeah. did. Yeah, but it's not that ugly. Well, except when the caterpillars eat it. Well, it's not actually, because this is why it stopped me in my tracks, because it's very sculptural. The leaves were yeah. beautiful and the flowers weren't that dull and unattractive. It was a curious plant. Yeah, so there you go. The catalyst of this story. Well, what could we do next week? How could we top your generosity of spirit, Stephen? Probably something that shows my negativity or, or ruthlessness. Yes, who knows? We, we, we need to cut me down before I get too holier than thou. So if you want to see how cruel and savage Stephen is, you'll have to subscribe and join us next week for a continuing adventure. So until then, Stephen. Goodbye all. See you next week.